From its first entry to its last, the Metal Gear series is filled with allusions and homages to great literature. In this episode one of Metal Gear Solid, we'll tackle arguably the most essential, George Orwell's 1984. Nineteen eighty four tells the story of Winston Smith, a middle aged bureaucrat who works at the Ministry of Truth, one of the three primary departments that form the basis of Ingsoch's political system. The novel begins as Winston decides to open a diary, something Ingsoch officially forbids. This leads to Winston resolving to defy the party by at first simply searching for whatever traces he can find of the one thing that Ingsoch claimed to have abolished completely, the real past. This search leads him towards an old proletarian shopkeep named Charrington, whose store is stocked full of old trinkets and who remembers innocuous things the rest of the world has forgotten like old nursery rhymes. But the search also leads Winston towards a man he's convinced shares his inner rebelliousness, an inner party member named O'Brien, as well as away from a young woman he's convinced is spying on him for the dreaded thought police, Julia. Winston soon finds Julia is following him, but not to spy, to rebel with him. Together, they do another thing the party ostensibly forbids, making passionate love. But in reality, this love is only play acting. Julia will sleep with anyone as a means of rebellion, while Winston is only interested in her to have a student to lecture to. All the while, Winston keeps having his decisions seemingly steered by vivid and recurring dreams. We gradually learn that his initial decision to open a diary and then to full-blown seek the party's defeat has been primed by events years in the making. The implication is that the Thought Police can control Winston even through his dreams. Before long, we learn the awful truth. Winston and Julia have been tricked by the Thought Police, which includes, as members, both the old man Charrington and the seemingly kindly O'Brien. They've been radicalized into becoming full-blown, willing terrorists. And this justifies the torture and re-education that comes next. It turns out that all along the way, Winston's been following down a path that the Thought Police, Ing Socha's version of the Gestapo or the Inquisition, have laid for him over a carefully planned course of decades. The way the party works is by blending together fact and fiction so that events they contrive become effectively real. Because the threat of nuclear weapons makes international war impossible, Oceania, a society built around maintaining a permanent war footing, wages permanent clandestine psychological warfare upon its own people. Their thought police use surveillance and what today we might call personal data tracking to sniff out potential thought criminals, coax and provoke their radicalization, and then quote-unquote reform them. This reformation process can only be described in computer terminology. Ingsoch overwrite the individual's mind as if it were data, rewiring their entire personality and point of view to make them into genuine converts to the Ingsoch ideology. Heart and Soul Throughout the novel's incredible and haunting third and final part, O'Brien educates Winston, using the entire book's previous events as cases in point. O'Brien explains where Winston went wrong was believing the past and even all of reality exist past a certain limited sense objectively. O'Brien elucidates how, by totally controlling and shaping the public mind, precisely by building a broken society on purpose that runs on suffering and failure and most of all human degradation, the party control all perception and thereby do in reality what tyrannical dictatorships and cabals from the Nazis to the Stalinists could only dare to dream of, building a revolution-proof, final revolution. 
To prove his point, O'Brien, using extremely sophisticated shock torture and psychological violence, gets Winston not merely to say, but to really see, to really believe that the concept of four does not exist, and that the number that follows three and results from adding two to two is not four, but five. Then, O'Brien hauls Winston off to the final torture chamber, room 101. This is inside the place that, through a mysterious method the novel never fully explains, of invading Winston's dreams for decades, O'Brien and the Thought Police have subliminally implanted in his mind the idea that the two of them were destined to meet and finally really talk. The place where there is no darkness, because there are no windows, and the perception of linear time does not exist. The Ministry of Love. It's here Winston is shown the perfect personalized torture the party has spent so long implanting in him as his ultimate nightmare now made real. It's a complex device that exposes Winston's face to the gnawing, gnashing teeth of starving rats. Now, as awful is the idea of having your face eaten by vermin, what many who read 1984 miss completely here is the unconscious, horrific significance the mere thought of this contraption for Winston represents. His worst memory is stealing food from his sick sister, back during the Civil War which gave rise to Oceania and the party. This was a breaking point for Winston's mother, who reacted by taking his sister and abandoning Winston forever. Obviously, guilt for this event has haunted Winston his whole life, but importantly, Winston was merely emulating the terrible role models that, as a result of the Civil War, were springing up. This psychoanalytic dimension is crucial to understanding 1984 and how the party uses trauma they've caused to trigger more of it. Importantly, this symbolic confrontation with Winston's own phantom, with starving rats no less inhuman or selfish as Winston feels that he was so many years ago, just the mere thought of it is far more torture on some deep psychological level than actually experiencing it. And by controlling the past, or at the very least Winston's perceptions of it, the Thought Police have rendered the Ingsoch slogan about the past, present, and future terrifyingly real. Thoughts are all the party care about, and thoughts are their ultimate weapons. Through controlling the present, the party is able to control the past, and by controlling the past, as Winston's entire life has now illustrated, the party can control the future. The party can make it so that, at least in the minds of its citizens and adherents, war is peace, Freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. Winston is even willing in the end to sell out Julia, the one he claims to love. The novel ends as a brainwashed Winston sits alone at an old cafe that's reappeared throughout the novel. Now he's just a mass-produced version of the very thought criminals whose presence there in the cafe first led him to decide to rebel many, many years ago, just as the thought police have planned it. At the very end, it seemingly revealed the entire story, the diary, and everything has not been a work of resistance at all, but a work actually sanctioned and approved of as propaganda for the party. It's easy to misunderstand the ending of 1984. Why does Winston give in and become the very thing he once hated? Well, because the party reroute his libidinal energies just like at the start, during the two minutes hate. He starts out hating Big Brother and loving the underground terrorist cell, the Brotherhood, totally missing the similar names, which by the way is a clue that both are apparently the creation of the Thought Police. That hatred for Big Brother, the party used the worst memory Winston has to redirect onto himself. Winston winds up convinced that all along it was really himself he was fighting his cold civil war against, and it's himself over whom in the end he declares victory. How can the party do this? Because they have zero morals and zero beliefs apart from the raw and naked pursuit of power, as they define it, strictly power over human minds. The party, you see, can cheat. They can break their own rules, break even fundamental rules governing basic logic, empirical facts, and reason. They can do all this because no one can stop them. And because they practice total information control. We see all this on full display in The Phantom Pain, in how the Patriots, or Cypher, are woven into all sides of the game's conflict, in how they present our protagonist, Venom Snake, no choice but to accept their realities that they provide until such time as another one becomes more useful. 
the nightmare of what they're actually doing to him, to us. The inability to ever independently verify the truth. It's all so horrifying that out of the hideous ecstasy of fear they've implanted in us, we must believe, as O'Brien says, we do not exist. Only the party exists, and exists everlasting. Only Big Brother, our Big Brother, Big Boss. There's a kind of comfort in that, the comfort of truth, of having a view of the world that makes sense, that can be externally verified. Even though it may be occasionally contradicted by your own eyes and ears. To escape that, all either Winston Smith or Venom Snake needs is to practice doublethink, the art of believing or perceiving two contradictory premises at once. Nineteen eighty four is written almost like hard boiled detective fiction. That sort of writing in the nineteen forties was associated with the so called dime store novel, not unlike how video games for decades were seen as artistically inferior to movies and books. So out of the gate, the first commonality is how Metal Gear and nineteen eighty four both defy their respective eras prevailing norms. Both in short are also formal hybrids. They demand a new audience to be born in order to understand them, satisfying neither of the two extremes within which they form a continuum between high and low art. Kojima understood the future was not in cinema but in gaming, much like Orwell, for better or worse, understood that dime store mass produced page turners had replaced the highbrow important novel. At the time of writing, the English-speaking world was the last bastion of so-called lowercase l liberalism, meaning roughly the doctrines of personal freedom, as the ancestor of the Enlightenment. Orwell was envisioning how totalitarianism, liberalism's complete opposite, could come to swallow it up. 1984 depicts a perversion of liberalism, whereby its most cherished notions like private autonomy and dissent and democracy, and even a knowable world, have all been turned upside down. The party who rules over Oceania are, for example, called Ingsoch, English Socialism. Yet very little, if anything, about Ingsoch resembles either English culture or socialism, as Orwell's age understood it. The topsy-turviness of this dystopian society famously finds expression in the three-party slogans War is peace, ignorance is strength, freedom is slavery. All three embody a fundamental concept in the novel known as doublethink. Winston Smith is a kind of metal gear, if you will, a cog in the Ingsoch machine. He thinks, or rather daydreams, that he can break free of this machine, and in so doing, cause the entire system to come solidly crashing down. But what he fails to honestly ever confront is that Ingsoch is what today we might call a post-industrial society. It's mass-producing not widgets, but human minds, and that includes Winston's. The basic structure, content, and themes of 1984 have been part of Metal Gear from the very beginning. The only difference, ironically, and in a self-aware sort of way, is an inversion. In 1984, Winston's led into thinking, for example, he's fighting the system by the system itself underneath the guise of a character named O'Brien. In the original Metal Gear, the opposite is true. Solid Snake thinks he's fighting to defend the status quo before uncovering his boss is actually the rebellious villain. Metal Gear 87 takes place in the region of South Africa, which, in the novel, is part of Oceania. What makes 1984 so fantastic is its commitment to world building. Throughout the book, for example, a war is supposedly going on between Oceania and one of the other two global superpowers, East Asia and Eurasia. But it's actually just political theater. Orwell's genius is in getting across the true purpose of warfare at a time when nuclear weapons have made full-scale war impossible. It's not, as every citizen in the novel thinks, a question of safety or even conflict. Permanent war benefits all three superpowers. Secretly, they are as good as allies against the real enemy, namely their own respective peoples. 
War in 1984 is crucial to the mind control that ironically keeps the so-called peace. The nature of any such society is such that particulars never really matter. All that matters is the thought, not any particular deed. One minute, the war in Africa is against Eurasia. The next, it could be against East Asia. And thanks to the doctrine of doublethink, no one would dare to point out the sudden change. No one would even allow themselves to recognize it. The original Metal Gear was poised to comment by way of George Orwell on the sudden change in geopolitical alignments in the real world. Back in 48, when Orwell finished the book, the US and Soviet Union were both deciding to pretend as if the other hadn't just fought as an ally, arm in arm against the Axis powers in World War II. When Metal Gear debuted in 1987, it was only a year after the US Congress had passed the Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act and roughly three years ahead of the end of the Cold War. The secret, of course, was the US and the UK's leaders were intimately involved with propping South Africa up as an apartheid state ever since the rise of minority white rule in 1948. This act of 1987 had been introduced as far back as 1972, but the geopolitics of the Cold War had prevented it from passing on two separate occasions. Metal Gear 87 takes place 200 kilometers north of a fictional place called Gaulsburg, South Africa. This all but certainly is a mixture of Johannesburg and Salzburg, Austria. In other words, if Orwell's Oceania was a mix of Stalinism and Churchillianism, Kojima's Outer Heaven, the mercenary kingdom the first game takes place in, is arguably a mix of the US-led and Nazi-led New World Orders during World War II. Like 1984, Metal Gear 87 is set in the near future. In fact, all of the Metal Gears are set either in a near possible future or a not so distant possible past. But while Orwell's novel takes place exclusively on the home front, the Metal Gear games take place exclusively on colonial frontiers, like in Central Asia or Afghanistan. The premise of Metal Gear wants to disillusion the player from blindly trusting in the inherent goodness of military force. This is like how Orwell's novel takes aim at the 19th century liberal's faith in a global utopianism. Every Metal Gear game is about how, in Orwell's phrasing, history has stopped. Language control and mind games keep the status quo in both respective works frozen in time. Even the various bad guys throughout the MGS series are simply looking to replace the powers that be, not truly to overthrow their system of worldwide enslavement. Even the player ourselves in the end of every Metal Gear game has no choice but to play out our role keeping the system in place, just like Winston Smith. In this way, we too come to see how freedom is slavery, war is peace, and ignorance is strength. George Orwell was actually the one who coined the phrase Cold War. His novel reflects the change brought about by nuclear weapons, and how by preventing war on foreign powers, they allow governments and empires to focus instead on waging war over their own population's minds. Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake imagines a world in the near future where even nuclear weapons are no longer in use. But while the world mistakenly thinks it's safer than ever, the first game's antagonist, Big Boss, returns to hijack the raw materials necessary for bringing nukes back. He also kidnaps and holds hostage a Czech-born scientist whose research holds the key to solving the world's mounting oil crisis. Like in 1984, shades of World War II abound throughout Metal Gear games. In the MSX era, for example, both titles involve working with local resistance fighters against the cult-like totalitarian regime of Big Boss called Outer Heaven. This name echoes that of the Outer Party in 1984, of which Winston Smith is a member. Big Boss is a sort of Hitlerian figurehead whose ideology, baked in the ethos and imagery of white supremacist symbols like the lightning bolt and the skull, worships his master race of warriors. In this respect, what unites the adherents of Big Bossism transcends race or ideology. It is an evolution, much like Ingsoch, out of the Nazi ideal of blood and soil. What the dictator's followers share isn't common blood or territory, it's a lingua franca, much like the subjects of Oceania. In Big Boss's case, this lingua franca, or bridge language, is one of warfare.
In 1998's Metal Gear Solid, the series ramps up its intrinsic Orwellianism. This time around, the very structure of how the game is put together reinvents aspects of the novel in revolutionary ways. Winston Smith is tricked into doing exactly the opposite of what he believes he's doing in the book. In MGS1 also, instead of stopping the terrorists from achieving nuclear capabilities, the player gets tricked into arming the enemy. And how MGS1 does this is by an immersive illusion that forms the basis not only of the story, but also the game's innovative use of real-time 3D. In 1984, meanwhile, Winston is shown, or given to play with, fragments of a supposed reality, of a supposed real past, that amount to little more than props. A piece of coral, an old man who's actually a member of the so-called Thought Police in disguise. The powers that be are so good at tricking and brainwashing because they use the techniques of movie making to permanently mix together or fuse reality with fiction. That's exactly what we also find in MGS1, and the entire series really. The terrorist threat is real in MGS1, but little else is. In truth, both the enemy and your so-called support staff are there whether they know it or not to bring Solid Snake and the player with him over to the side of the status quo. Just like Winston Smith, by the time any of the truth comes out, it will be too late. And again, this goes beyond the storyline directly into the gameplay. MGS1 was among the earliest games to feature 3D environments and a free camera in first person. Along, of course, with games on the Nintendo 64 like Super Mario or Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Yet little to none of what we think we see is real here in two senses for MGS1 as for 1984. These stacks of crates, these nuclear missiles, and many other examples are only here to sell the fiction interactively that we are inside a secret nuclear disposal plant, but that's merely what we're supposed to think until it becomes more advantageous to reveal to us it's all a lie. Even then, nothing gets revealed in MGS1 unless it serves some purpose as a lie. Truth and lie they are no different from the way that MGS1 hybridizes together the supposedly mutual exclusive registers of 2D and 3. This of course epitomizes Doublethink, the central tenet of Ingsosh. In the modern age, old binary distinctions and mutual exclusives break down and become permeable. This was a major point being made by everything about MGS2, Sons of Liberty. And this, of course, also describes how peace and war in the game have fused together, too, into a sort of borderline police state. Defined, much like Oceania is, by the use of mind control and movie-like fantasies. As well as an inability of the average person to be able to tell them apart. MGS 1 and 2 are supposed to take place at a time when the world's never been safer from the specter of nuclear weapons, and yet we see they're actually rather easy to obtain. The characters, the Armstead president, and the DARPA chief were actually building a next generation 21st century nuclear doomsday machine, the likes of which the world has never seen, they were even going to mass produce it. And not only to maintain a nuclear power balance, but to keep the military industrial complex that came into being out of World War II in existence. Even MGS-1's setting on the Aleutian Island chain echoes a former front line from World War II. It was here the Japanese and American militaries were both encamped at a major passageway into either's respective sphere of influence. The commitment to showcasing the falsifiability of reality entered a new phase with Sons of Liberty, though. In 1984, the young character Julia is used to contrast with the point of view of the middle-aged protagonist Winston. And while the exact same dynamic can be seen in MGS1 between Snake and the character Meryl, in MGS2 it's as if we are playing this time around as the equivalent to Julia uh, by way of the newcomer Raiden. Like MGS1 had, MGS2 echoes 1984 in its many sudden twists of betrayal. The Special Forces unit, Dead Cell, like Foxhound, were once allies with the government, and at one point the player gets literally betrayed by Snake himself. 1984 is defined by its betrayals. 
But more than any Metal Gear game before it, Sons of Liberty builds on Orwell's linguistic ideas, showcasing how culture, technology, and language can all be exploited to become tools of mind control and neo-totalitarianism. MGS3 brings the series back into the 20th century with an even more Orwellian and bent than ever before. Set roughly 20 years between World War II and the year 1984, MGS3, Snake Eater, taking place in 1964, is all about the amoral Machiavellian character of geopolitics in the wake of the war. Yet again, everything is a carefully constructed house of lies, with the player sent reeling from one betrayal and ruse to the next. More than ever, MGS3 epitomizes the three Ingsoch slogans, war is peace, ignorance is strength, freedom is slavery. The breakdown of family ties and genuine love that we read about in the novel is put on full display here. MGS4, meanwhile, takes Orwell fully into the 21st century. A major theme in the novel is Orwell's fear that in the near future, the logic of the Industrial Revolution will be applied to reshaping the human mind. The famous Ingsoch logo, after all, is of a human and robot handshake, atop the World War II era propaganda V for Victory. The revolution Ingsoch destroyed society to build remains permanent as a state of emergency, this was, again, a nod to both Nazism, in this case to the infamous Reichstag fire, and to Stalinist Russia, where the purges and surveillance and mass hysteria that brought Lenin's regime to power became, under Stalin, never-ending. In this era, communism was inherently an idea of mechanized modernity. Marx had preached about the necessity of an industrialized proletariat, while Stalin, after all, the man who mass-murdered and starved his way into single-handedly industrializing Russia, had a name that also meant Man of Steel. Well, in MGS4's version of the early 21st century, Orwell's fears, which were predicated on this context, become completely realized. War has become peace as an entire globe-spanning system we see in the game controls warfare by subjecting it to the laws of capitalism to become just like any other industry. And through it, as a proxy, the human mind also falls under that system's control. Meanwhile, those human minds are kept enslaved by reality-suppressing nanomachines, a means of automating doublethink. Unmanned autonomous weapons and vehicles fight alongside living, breathing men, one no more or less valuable than the other, while warfare itself becomes perpetual. The game's iconic opening scene seems to directly echo yet another Ingsoch slogan, perhaps the most important one. Who controls the past controls the future, who controls the present controls the past. Snake tells us in the opening, he who controls the battlefield controls history. <laughs> Lastly, in the mainline games, we have the single most explicitly and extensively Orwelling in MGS, MGS V The Phantom Pain. The Phantom Pain plays with memory and nightmares and the novel's notion of information control on a whole other level. There's actually a lot more to say here, which I cover in a coming video on MGSV and the subject of linguistic imperialism. And maybe if this and that video is successful, I'll come back with a third, even longer video on just 1984 and MGSV. As always, it's up to you. Orwell was a genius whose name and ideas are constantly misunderstood, appropriated, and even sometimes exploited. His masterpiece, 1984, endures in relevancy as maybe the greatest novel of the 20th century, as well as a haunting premonition of at least one way of thinking about modern, so-called post-industrial society. The same, roughly, can also be said of MGS, which always seemed one step ahead of some version of the real near future. As people keep reading 1984, here's hoping they keep playing Hideo Kojima's masterpiece. Until next time, boss.